In thinking about this uh, session, I was reflecting back on the past year. And uh, I, in my job as senior forestry officer with FAO, I go to a lot of meetings around the region, often a lot more meetings than I wish to go to. Uh, but all of the first part of last year, virtually every meeting I attended, there was discussion about the upcoming Paris UNFCCC COP meeting. And everybody was wondering, you know, would we actually get a climate change agreement coming out of Paris? What would it include? How robust would it be? Would it have any teeth? And at the same time, the countries of the world were busy meeting in various negotiation sessions to discuss the sustainable development goals, the so-called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And again, people were wondering how many SDGs we would end up with. Would we have 15 or 34 or 27? Uh, how detailed they would be? what kind of indicators we would have to try to monitor and track them, these sorts of questions. But pleasantly, by the end of the year, we, we did have a Paris Agreement on climate change, including a very strong focus on forestry and forests and the land sectors. And we had agreement on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We also had most countries coming forward with serious commitments in their nationally determined commitments. So then the, the calendar turned and the new year started and people started asking the difficult question. Now that we have this, how do we put them into action? We find countries in particular scrambling, uh, struggling and in many cases to put into practical application what their negotiators, negotiators had committed to in Paris and in other negotiating sessions. So as uh, Minister Freidenberg mentioned uh, this morning, it's really the question is how we can ma maintain the momentum that was generated with the Paris Agreement as we move forward in the uh, forestry sector and natural resources. Do we have the right institutions and governance in place? Do we have the policies and regulations that can drive action in the directions we want? What financing do we need and where is it going to come from? And what will be the roles of the various players, private sector and government and others? So these are some of the questions that uh, our panel will address this morning. And uh, just to outline a little bit how we will, we will operate um, for the panel session. First, we will have an introductory presentation from Ibu Noor uh, Masripat Masripatan. <laughs> Sorry. So used to calling Ibu Noor only Ibu Noor. <laughs> Struggle with the family name. Uh, then we will have, uh, I will invite the panelists to have initial thoughts and perspectives on the topic overall. And we'll have some give and take in panel discussion and hopefully have room for questions from you from the floor before closing. Uh, I would like to first, before Ibu Noor begins uh, with her presentation, to very briefly introduce our panels. Uh, we've been invited to keep the introductions very short because they're all in included and you can access them from the internet, the website for the conference. But uh, Ibu, Ibu Noor is the Director General of Climate Change Management uh, with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Indonesia. To my immediate left, we have uh, Justin Lee, who is the Deputy Head of Mission to Indonesia from the Government of Australia. And uh, next down the line is uh, Mr. Henning Hortland Johansson, who is the Minister Counselor and Deputy Representative to ASEAN from the Norwegian Embassy based in Jakarta. And finally, as you already uh, were introduced this morning and know well, uh, Dr. Peter Holmgren, who is the Director General of the Center for International Forestry Research. So to get us started, I would like to invite Ibu Noor to give us a short presentation on this topic overall, introduce us to the issues.
Thank you, Patrick. Uh, colleague, uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's always good uh, to see uh, familiar faces and uh, new people in uh, occasion or meeting like uh, like this. In uh, trying to uh, address the issues that need to be uh, covered, uh, guided uh, by the organizing uh, committee, uh, I will start with the uh, introduction. Uh, let's see uh, the situation in Asia Pacific uh, forest. Uh, with uh, 740 million hectares of uh, forest area, or 26 percent of global tropical uh, rainforest, and also uh, with 4.4 uh, billion people, uh, about 60 percent. Region will uh, play an important part uh, of NDC in many countries of our region. When we talk about negotiation in forests, our role of forest and climate change, our uh, attention or our mind will be brought to uh, first about CDM. And we also learn how we end up with CDM. And of course, we don't want uh, to have uh, a red plus uh, and uh, like a CDM forestry. So let's see how uh, we have gone through with 10 years red plus uh, negotiation and piloting. Uh, forest has been uh, played an important uh, role in the climate negotiation uh, since uh, the past 10 years. We uh, also uh, look at that situation. The reason was the alarming uh, rate of deforestation and uh, forest degradation in developing uh, countries on one side, and in another side is the important uh, role of forest, both for national development and also in uh, livelihood for millions of people in uh, our region. This is also one of the reasons why uh, forest has uh, been a place as important a sector in the climate change agenda since then. Ten years we have negotiation under UNFCCC as uh, produced sufficient guidance for uh, both uh, Red Plus countries, also uh, for our um, partners in supporting the result based uh, Red Plus implementation. And in this uh, same period, we have a lot of experience in uh, piloting with Red Plus Red, at various uh, skills and approaches. And with this piloting experience also in negotiation, has set light on what issues to be addressed for Red Plus full implementation. And more importantly, in the context of uh, Paris Agreement, Red also provided concrete example and valuable lessons for developing transparency framework that is very important part of the Paris Agreement. If you look at the uh, support for uh, Red Plus, since the beginning uh, of the negotiation of Red Plus after Montreal uh, to 2014, a certain uh, record, a number of uh, record on uh, Red Plus Finance, one of the records from Center for Global Development, recorded that uh, there has been about uh, 9.8 billion, in which almost 90% of the pledge originated from public sector. We can understand why uh, mostly from public se sector, as uh, we know that Red Plus so far mostly is uh, still in a readiness or transition phase and uh, also when we talk about Red Plus 
result is fine and that's still uh, based on non-market approaches. FAO also recorded uh, additional 5 billion uh, pledges by Norway, Germany, UK in uh, Paris. The challenge now is how to effectively incentivize Red Plus countries with the existing rules, including Warsaw Framework, while uh, preparing implementation of Paris Agreement from 2020 uh, onwards. We know now that uh, still very a uh, few countries that got the incentives uh, through result-based uh, payment. That's the challenge in um, Red Plus. Then role of private sector. We know that role, uh, role of private uh, sector uh, has continuously uh, gained increasing uh, attention. In Paris, a uh, role of uh, private sector was formally um, recognized under the decision that uh, within the role of party stakeholder, non-party stakeholder, where um, parties should enhance the role of non-party stakeholders, uh, including private sector. There is a role also called presidencies, high-level champions, and um, non-party, uh, non-actor, non-state actors, a zone for climate change, uh, action. This is also uh, the room for recognition of private sector. However, interna internationalization or uh, internalization uh, to the national context uh, should be in accordance with national regulation, also national circumstances, policies, uh, so that we could uh, integrate the word integration, integrate our effort uh, to be uh, one integrating, integrated national effort and global effort. And then, what is the positive, positive impacts to forest governance? If we look at the efforts done by developing countries, we are talking about Asia uh, Pacific uh, region. We have shown a lot of progress uh, in the effort of strengthening a governance system through various policy in intervention. Some example, and clearly in the forestry sector certification, uh, including uh, the assurance of su sustainable uh, sources of, of uh, timber being, being imported and exported. And uh, this is it's very important strengthening a trade cooperation that could provide su sufficient incentives to sustainable uh, product from forests. In our case, there are a number of uh, policy interventions that we do. Uh, uh, first, uh, about one a map policy that uh, to encourage the compliance uh, and also uh, to the uh, compliance to the spatial uh, plan, the compliance to use the same uh, base map for uh, our uh, policy decision, and also uh, a number of policy uh, reform in order to restore our degraded uh, pitland and. Uh, improving our uh, peatland ecosystem uh, management. Uh, our contribution in our INDC, uh, Indonesia committed to reduce uh, emission by 21 to 49 percent uh, to 41 percent by uh, 2030 compared to business as usual. Uh, with this commitment, uh, like at all other parties, we have to uh, communicate, we have to formulate uh, our long-term uh, carbon development uh, strategy, strategy, low carbon development strategy. There are three principles that uh, uh, we put there in uh, NDC implementation, enable economic growth and put uh, people welfare as a priority. And the second, uh, support the uh, protection of poor and ful vulnerable uh, communities, environmental uh, uh, conservation. And uh, also focus on the uh, intervention that reduces emission and strengthen policy uh, framework. This is the last slide, opportunity for uh, collaboration in the region. Uh, with the diversity of our national circumstances, capacities, and uh, also capabilities. This open opportunity for a wide range of uh, area for regional uh, cooperation. 
If we talk about the forestry uh, sector uh, alone, investment in sustainable forestry, or if we talk about the broader uh, skill in landscape uh, approach, uh, in investment in this area under various schemes when we are not CCC also uh, important. With NDCs, pastors are to undertake and communicate ambitious effort on mitigation, adaptation, and also providing means of implementation, as well as uh, transparency uh, framework. Under Paris Agreement, uh, we know that transparency framework will uh, play a critical role in assessing both collective and individual contribution to the global efforts in achieving the climate uh, convention objective. Asia Pacific countries could collaborate in building and implementing the transparency framework, both for action and uh, support, including in addressing the methodological challenge on forest oil and sector accounting. That's all that uh, I could share this morning in order to address the question that uh, we need to uh, discuss under this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Noor. Uh, excellent introduction to the issues, uh, presenting a lot of uh, things for us to think about and to dig in more deeply. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite each of the rest of the panel, the other panel members, to share their ideas and perspectives on how we go forward, just with a general question to, to start with, uh, to share ideas, and then we can dig into some specifics as we go along. Uh, Justin, would you like to start and give us some of your ideas? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here today. Um, I'm uh, based in, uh, in Jakarta, and I have responsibility for Australia's uh, development cooperation projects there, and particularly our, our cooperation with Indonesia. Um, I'll just probably touch on on, on perhaps five, five things to say um, around this area of, of collaboration. Um, I think first is to highlight the importance um, of the sector, of the forestry and land sector, and how welcome it was that the Paris Agreement in Article 5 um, recognised the, the importance there, uh, clearly for countries in the region, as was reflected in the INDCs. Um, the forestry and land sector is, is very important for countries' strategies. Um, I think for Indonesia, it's uh, around 63% of the total emissions, and for a number of other countries in the region, uh, it is a very important sector. I think the uh, first point that I would emphasise uh, is the importance of, of taking a holistic policy approach. I think many of um, the challenges that we see uh, in addressing uh, forest degradation and, and deforestation um, also relates to other issues around uh, agricultural practice, um, um, atmospheric pollution, uh, development. Uh, so clearly there's a range of uh, policy issues that need to be considered together and I think for governments to consider them in a holistic way uh, is important. Uh, I also think that there's opportunities in that. Uh, I think as we see in, in Ibunur's country, in, in Indonesia, um, that uh, the energy picture is, is also important in this and, and for countries like Indonesia to make progress um, in addressing um, greenhouse gas emissions from the forestry sector will not only help in achieving its INDC, but will also provide um, opportunities to meet its uh, ambitious electricity generation targets as well. So again, uh, considering these policies in a holistic way, um, I, I think is very important for governments and there's a, a range of benefits that can uh, come from this, both in terms of environmental governance um, and economic governance. So it is a very um, broad issue. Um, the second point I'd like to make, uh, and I've kind of elevated this in, in my own thinking um, over hearing people speak, but it is the importance of um, engaging um, with uh, people and, and the people's participation um, and with the private sector. And I think in many ways we, we need to put uh, people first um, uh, in this. I think, again, the good thing about the Paris Agreement, taking a broader perspective um, of, the, of the forestry issues uh, and the potentials here. 
um, means that we are thinking about broader uh, development policy as well. Um, without the buy-in uh, of, of smallholders, uh, of people in these areas, without the buy-in of the private sector, um, it makes it uh, very difficult to, to achieve um, what, what we're aiming to do. Uh, I know if we look around the world today, um, uh, ordinary people are, are often talking about um, uh, the various economic policies that are being developed for them and at times expressing frustration that they're not seeing the benefits of, of, of economics or of, of I think what's called trickle-down economics. Um, I'd, I'd like to introduce the term uh, of trickle-down environmentalism as well. I think sometimes um, if we are prioritising uh, environmental issues and, and climate change, we're asking people to um, see the benefits um, trickle down to them of, that, of those environmental actions. Well, I think, again, by putting the people first in that, we need to very clearly demonstrate um, that by uh, mainstreaming um, climate change and environmental policies and forestry policies into our national development policies, um, show very clearly what the benefits are um, to, uh, to, the, to the people in those areas, then we get much stronger buy-in and much more success of our policies. So I think that that is the uh, uh, second aspect I'd like to emphasise. I know that's a, a focus of this uh, conference and with later sessions. Uh, my third point, and it's only three or of, three of five, uh, is around um, a, a coordinated approach. Uh, again, uh, having, um, having uh, so many different policy areas involved is fundamentally important for governments to coordinate both horizontally uh, and vertically the different ministries that are um, responsible for the different policy areas uh, and also engage um, um, uh, at different levels of government from the national level down to the provincial levels uh, and, and local levels. I think that's fundamentally important. Um, and also uh, have coordination for international partners that would like to be involved, um, in our case, uh, uh, Australia, uh, Norway, other countries that wish to engage uh, in, in this area and, and cooperate. Fourthly, um, for, for the uh, international community that looks to engage in this and to say a little bit about Australia's approach, um, we are uh, an approach where we're looking at partnerships uh, with countries, certainly through our development cooperation program in Indonesia, which deals with economic governance uh, and with environmental governance, we are looking at an economic partnership. And uh, what we are aiming to do is to leverage the resources that are available. So our approach is one of providing technical assistance and technical advice that can work with countries in the region um, to leverage uh, their own resources, which in many cases are very significant, uh, multilateral resources, and also resources from the private sector and local communities. So I'd like to emphasise that point of, um, of technical partnership in order to leverage resources that are available. Uh, in this sector, uh, Australia has considerable expertise in uh, monitoring, reporting um, and, and evaluation in the MRV and to strengthen the transparency systems. And we're very pleased that our minister this morning um, was able to um, reiterate that uh, we will be looking at a further um, cooperation with Indonesia on its, on its INCAS, on its uh, National Carbon Accounting Scheme. Uh, and also through other global initiatives such as the GFOI, the Global Forest Observations Initiative, um, we, uh, we hope that again we can help in that MRV uh, and transparency side with, with governments that are interested. Uh, and more broadly, um, strongly supporting sharing of uh, information, uh, again in our own instance through our Emissions Reduction Fund which has developed um, a number of methodologies for reducing emissions, including from the land and agricultural sector, uh, and enshrining those in legislation. And finally, um, my, my last point is probably just around um, speed and, and, and urgency uh, of action, um, that um, clearly we don't want to move um, precipitously, quickly, um, just doing things for the sake of doing things, um, but clearly this is an, an important challenge. We do need to deliver on our INDCs, and I think for the Red Plus activities, um, we've been talking about what we what we can do, and we've been developing uh, ideas. But um, there's lots of new institutions that are being developed around the world uh, to address uh, climate change. 
Uh, we've got the GCF uh, now up and running. We have also the, the World Bank and other multilateral funds. I think it is important that um, Red Plus activities uh, stamp their mark, as it were, um, that there will be competition for, for funding, there will be other sectors that will be um, developing uh, activities, uh, and I think it's important that we um, start to develop those, um, uh, those solid methodologies that will continue to attract finance from those resources that are available that really uh, wish to take, that, uh, take those opportunities that are there, because it is a, also a competitive environment. So I think that, that pace of operating is very important. But I think those are some things I'd like to emphasise. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, I'd really like to come back uh, in a few minutes to your point about putting people first. Uh, and I like uh, very much the points, uh, your last point about the urgency. I think uh, many people have talked about Red Plus being one of the last best chances for forestry, if you will. We've not always performed so well in the past, and uh, we have a great opportunity now. Uh, we need to per perform and deliver on these uh, expectations while the opportunity exists. Uh, could I skip down to uh, Henning and invite uh, your perceptions, uh, perspectives uh, to start with? Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, dear delegates, friends, honorable ministers. Uh, Norway was one of the first countries in the world to ratify the Paris Agreement and our strong supporters of committed international cooperation to make sure we do not cross the one and a half centigrade threshold. Um, since 2010, Norway has had uh, big climate and forest cooperation with Indonesia, uh, which as you are all aware of, has the third largest rainforest in the, uh, in the world after the Amazon and Congo basins, where we also have cooperation. Um, and the point being that we need to, to continue to work on, on verifiable emission reductions and we are very happy to see that that these issues are taken into the Paris Declaration, Paris Agreement. Um, <clears throat> the Norwegian Prime Minister and the Norwegian Minister for Climate and, and Environment have both visited Indonesia recently and both reiterated that this pledge of uh, approximately one billion US dollars to Indonesia in this area is standing. Um, while cooperation between governments are of invaluable importance in order to ensure the goals of the Paris Agreement are met, it's clearly that we need the help of the private sector and that they are in the front line to these contributions. The World Economic Forum conducted a survey among 750 global experts earlier this year and the environment came out as the top challenge for the world economy. This is something that I'm sure everyone in this room is already aware of, but the survey shows that it's also now becoming truth and something that the world as a whole is getting aware of, which should make it a decent time to ensure that the private sector gets on board wholly and fully. Um, I think, therefore, that any pledge among business actors to voluntarily improve practices and reduce emissions to serve credit. Um, and we, as representatives of government, then need to make sure that these pledges can work more easily, whether that is by reducing red tape or in other way making sure that any voluntary improvement of practice does not end up costing the businesses more than it would have cost to continue as usual. Um, business, private business and private sector stands for about nine out of ten jobs in developing countries. And without a continued economic growth and raising people out of poverty, the people will not accept to be a part of and working in favor of improving the environment and working for climate. For my own part, uh, being Norway's deputy representative to ASEAN, um, I would also like to highlight the potential of this organization as an actor also in the fight against deforestation and climate change. Uh, ASEAN's 10 member countries have considerable amount of forests, which uh, do not only work as enormous greenhouse gas sinks, but which also provides a place to live and a source of income for indigenous people, um, a habitat for innumerable species of animals and plants. 
the 10 countries might have different approaches and motivation for address, addressing the issues of climate change and deforestation, but ASEAN could evolve into an even more important arena for these discussions uh, and get the centrality that I think that they deserve. Uh, even if the slogan on climate, at least back home, has for years been think globally, act locally, uh, I do believe that there is a very clear advantage to including a cooperate regionally into that. It might reduce the slogans catching us a little bit, but with, uh, without working together, there is no way that we're going to reach these goals. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I notice the next session panel's discussion will include a strong industry and private sector focus. So, I'm sure they will pick up on many of these, these aspects and look forward to hearing their perspectives. And now, finally, I'd like to invite Peter Holmgren to share his perspectives. He also always has some very interesting and thought-provoking ideas. So he, sa he saved them from his opening uh, keynote address so, so we can still keep on the edge of our chairs. OK, thanks. Thanks, Pat, for raising the expectations. Um, this panel is a bit interesting. Uh, four out of five are based in Indonesia, Jakarta. And uh, four of us are, are northern male. So I don't know if that, that says about diversity, but um, let's, let's uh, move on. Now, my country, my home country is actually Sweden. And uh, I want to refer to uh, a, a survey that was made not so long ago about uh, the importance of forests and why forests are important. And the Swedish citizens answered this question. And they got three choices. The highest mark was for. Um, mitigating climate change. 78% thought that this was an important function of forests. Only about 40% thought that uh, uh, forest products and, and the forest industry was important. And this is Sweden, one of the most intensively uh, managed forest countries and, and, and uh, forest industry uh, since many, many years. Now, to me, this represents both a tremendous success and a tremendous risk. It's, of course, a tremendous success that we've managed to up the awareness among the public that climate change is important and serious and that forests play a big role in it. But on the other hand, we've also reached a point where the climate change debate around forests sort of dominates so much so that other benefits from the forest are, are less visible. And this is the risk, in my view, and, and this is also where, where I think this discussion is going at the moment. Um, I'm coming back to my, my thoughts on integration here, and, and if you read the Paris Agreement, it actually starts off by a lot of text around in the context of sustainable development. This is a key uh, formulation that appears several times in the, in the, in the first paragraphs, uh, first uh, uh, articles. and, and uh, Conversely, the sustainable development framework includes a goal on climate change. This is good integration, in my view. And it, it is an integration that hasn't always been there. Um, because in the, within the UN, the different institutions and, and processes have also acted in isolation. And we now see some movements towards more uh, integration at the political level. This is good. And I think should, this should also spill over on how we handle forests and climate change and forests and sustainable development. Um, so if we then zoom in on forests and, and the Paris Agreement, um, we, we are, th there is a kind of, for, for, for us as a research organization and for, for many others out there that want to, to make a difference uh, in the world, we are, we are in, a, in a bit of a um, difficult stage at the moment because a lot of the efforts, I think Pat alluded to this in his introduction, a lot of the efforts leading up to last year's agreements on sustainable development and, and, uh, and the climate um, were so focused that we, in a way, perhaps lost perspective of things. And if we talk about forests, and, and I'm part of this, uh, I think we, over the past decade, if in any international debate, forests have been equivalent to red, at least in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the developing uh, world context. Um, this has been good. Again, it's been a tremendous success to raise the issues of uh, deforestation and forest degradation to this level. We've had heads of states 
uh, meetings where, where this has been uh, debated fiercely. I remember the first time I met Howard was actually in, in the UN General Assembly where we had 14 heads of states and heads of government debating red. It's fantastic. But now we are beyond those agreements and we need to get back to that perspective. How do we now integrate and how do we provide a holistic approach to forests and climate change? Uh, one way, perhaps, to look at it is that instead of talking about co-benefits of climate action, we should see that it is the climate benefits that are the co-benefits of sustainable development actions. Then we begin to approach a holistic and integrated approach to forest and climate change. The Paris Agreement also talks a lot more about, is a lot more global in nature uh, than, than uh, earlier uh, uh, agreements and, and protocols on forests. Fair enough, the Kyoto Protocol was, was of course, um, uh, addressing uh, Annex 1 countries. Um, so, those are some of my, my starting points, and, and I'd like to end this by coming to three areas that I think we could take, where we, we, where we could take things forward. Um, the first one is to move the debate and the action out of the uh, preservation corner. Um, I'm the first to argue that we need to conserve forests worldwide to much a much larger extent than we do today. But we need to get the perspective of other benefits and uses of, of the forests as well. Um, the second is, again, integrate that, well, I mentioned that already, we, we should perhaps look at climate benefits from forestry and landscapes as co-benefits of all those other things we need to achieve. And that might be a more palatable approach to the stakeholders on the ground as well. Um, at least we should explore that. And the third one is, and, and I think this is perhaps um, um, something that has been disappearing over the past decade. I think we need to go back and embrace and, and enhance the use of wood and biomass in our economy, including for energy purposes. Otherwise, we will perhaps not realize the potentials that the photosynthesis gives us in terms of providing for all sorts of goods and benefits and value chains that we, that we need. And um, Actually, I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see some exhibitions of wood products at, at this conference outside, and uh, that's, uh, that's a good sign, in, in my view. Um, again, this does not say that the climate change threat is real. We need serious action to, to deal with it. Um, but I think the, the, uh, the, the, the movement now is perhaps to see that in a bigger perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I think everybody realizes that uh, the real action in all of this has to take place at the uh, country level and down on the ground. And uh, international organizations and national governments and other organizations have invested a lot of effort already in red readiness and preparation for moving forward, uh, including uh, FAO and other partners under the UN Red program. I'd like to ask especially Ibu Noor, who struggles with this at the national level, uh, and maybe then Peter, uh, because I know C4 has looked a lot at the experience with some of the initial red piloting. Uh, what really is uh, the one or two biggest hurdles that you are facing right now to moving forward at the country level or getting things moving on the ground? Maybe you have more than one or two, but maybe you can highlight <laughs> the most serious ones that you can see. Yeah, um, I think um, learning from our uh, experience, uh, the, the most uh, challenging part in our uh, case is uh, uh, preparing the uh, funding instrument to enable us uh, uh, tapping uh, the red uh, finance that uh, are uh, like available at the international level. Um, and through our bilateral cooperation uh, with uh, Norway, uh, actually both of us uh, are struggling um, how we could uh, uh, have uh, 
the best and the most feasible uh, institutional uh, setting for uh, red uh, plus uh, finance in our country. Um, but uh, we have to work on the uh, existing uh, regulations and we know that uh, uh, there are uh, a number of uh, uh, con conflicting arrangement that uh, uh, we find there. So we, we really are uh, struggling. And um, uh, thankfully that uh, uh, Norway uh, then from time to time, time trying to understand how we, we are struggling with that situation and now we are uh, preparing the, um, the draft regulation and hopefully uh, we could solve. That's really, this is the, the, the most hard things. The second is uh, about the um, technical and methodological uh, aspect. Not uh, because we don't have uh, expert there, but uh, how um, the methodological uh, instrument that we are preparing prepared by expert uh, could be uh, implemented by the uh, practitioner in the in the region later on in the implementation I think this too thank you I think these are our very valuable perspectives and uh, I also have um, been a bit frustrated over the years that we may be making things too complicated and in the case of Indonesia we have uh, financing sitting there and, and not only in Indonesia, but uh, potential to access from GEF and uh, now Green Climate Fund. Uh, but uh, sometimes we make things more difficult and complicated than they need to be in order to motivate action. So uh, I think this is one of the issues that is coming to the forefront. Uh, Peter, I know that C4 has done reviews of some of the experience, not only in Indonesia, but elsewhere on this uh, experience to date. So. Have you come up with some commonalities or some key hurdles that countries are struggling with? No, thanks. Uh, we've been entrusted by, by many, including Australia and Norway, to, to work on research on, on the, uh, the red opportunities around the world. And we've worked both at, uh, shall we say, higher policy levels and looked at uh, uh, the, the uh, institutional arrangements and we looked at the uh, capacities for MRV. We've also looked at uh, the local level and, and seen how do efforts um, pan out uh, if you apply them in, in, in a community or um, a province. Um, I won't refer to all of these different results. That, that would be, it's been a major part of CFRO's work over the past seven or eight years and hopefully it's been useful for the for the uh, governments and other stakeholders that, that need to make decisions um, I think it's it's uh, fair to say that a, a commonality in in our results particularly when we look at the impact locally is that the difficulties to both integrate the red effort and at the same time keep it separate so that it fits into the mechanism that's being designed is a major area of, of tension. Integrating it because how do you make it a significant part of, of reality for people uh, on the ground? It, it, is, it is not obvious that the, the benefits of, of a red action is so significant in comparison with all the other um, benefits that, that uh, need to be um, harnessed and harvested. Um, in this, on the separation issue, it's obvious that it isn't as clear-cut as it may sound in the negotiation stage, that you can separate out the uh, actions um, that lead to mitigation and therefore can be accounted for and therefore can be paid for. Um, when you go down to the local scale, it all becomes somewhat blurred on, of, on what is what. And, and uh, therefore, again, both of these observations are arguments for finding more holistic approaches and, and better ways to integrate uh, action with, with the rural economy at, at large. Uh, so th those, are, those are some uh, experiences. I'd like to also take one example, and that, that's the um, um, unfortunate fire and haze situation we've had repeatedly in this region, um, but particularly last year. 
and um, it's, an, it's an example both of the uh, integration and separation aspects. Um, integration because when, when the uh, uh, fire started and the haze was uh, choking uh, people in Singapore and elsewhere, the news media first reacted by saying that, oh, this is a serious threat to the climate. But it took some time before the reporting and the awareness also talked about millions of people having health hazards, thousands of people uh, being, uh, became, became, being ill from the smoke, businesses suffering, and, and agriculture outputs being, uh, being uh, reduced. So the point here is that, yes, it was it had effect on, on uh, the global climate, but it also had a lot of other effects on, on the local situations. Um, so I, I think that this is, this is a, an example that argues for taking a more holistic approach. Indonesia is making lots of efforts in this area, and uh, it includes the climate change uh, uh, issues, but it also includes all the other sustainable development aspects of how the resources are managed. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to come back to uh, Justin's point about putting people first. And uh, I think give uh, Henning and Justin a particular opportunity to comment on this. But uh, there have been various uh, concerns in, and some experience in some places with initial Red Plus uh, activities or planning that uh, tend to per perhaps threaten the uh, the, the uh, livelihoods or the life of uh, indigenous people or local people in general. And there's concern of the, the potential negative impacts of some of these climate change actions. So negotiations have put in place uh, certain requirements for safeguards, and this is a, a concern of how to make these effective as well. So maybe the two of you could comment on this. And I think it also ties into Peter's comment about uh, turning things around and looking at the at climate change benefits being the co-benefits, really, if we're really putting people first. Thank you again, uh, Patrick. Uh, just on the uh, climate change as a co-benefit, and, and I think I, I very much agree with uh, uh, with with Peter there. Um, of uh, again, what we've talked about more broadly around uh, also uh, mainstreaming uh, climate change policies uh, and environmental policies um, into uh, many other uh, government policies, uh, particularly uh, ec economic policies. I, I guess. Of course, and it's a it's a caveat that goes uh, that, that goes out having to say it specifically. But of course, you don't want to lose the lose the climate change uh, in that. Um, I guess there's always a, a risk that when you do um, make it second as a as a co-benefit, that um, uh, that somehow along the way you, you might lose the focus there, or you might lose the the importance of it uh, as an issue. And I, and I think it, it goes without saying that that's certainly not the intention. Um, and so uh, I think that's just worth worth noting. Um, in terms of the uh, putting people first, um, uh, again, Peter, I think, has, has drawn very relevant examples on how that has resonance, and particularly in the smoke haze issue um, of, of last year. Uh, I, I think what, what's very relevant is um, the, the next discussion around um, financial models of some of the uh, activities that are being developed. Um, clearly, uh, uh, the, the financial, the, the livelihood systems that are being uh, developed, be they for smallholders, be they for the private sector, um, and where they're coming from, whether they're, and, and ideally they'll, they'll come from the private sector um, with cooperation uh, of others, but they clearly need to be um, a, as profitable as what is occurring at the moment. So I think they need very sound. Um, um, financial uh, basis because uh, clearly if uh, uh, if lands are of certain types are necessarily being taken uh, out of production um, or alternative livelihoods are being proposed uh, they need to have that same uh, uh, clearly profitable and, and financial benefit so I think that 
uh, that discussion um, is, is fundamentally important. Um, I do think that uh, much of it, um, there's much focus on the, on the multilateral funds and there's focus on, on grants. Um, those funds are, are important and again, as I said, I think those funds um, are important for leveraging, um, for, um, for, for doing R&D, um, but ultimately I think the, uh, the financial systems that are being developed, uh, again, will come from um, the private sector, will come from people themselves. And so I think that that cooperation um, is very uh, important, but they need to have a very, um, we need to have a very sound, sustainable, uh, financial as well as environmental basis. And I think we'll need to tap into those um, much more extensive sources of funding that are available in the private sector. Henning? Yeah, I agree. And the, the idea of putting people, people first is, uh, it is it's so obvious that it's sometimes easy to forget. And, and it comes from both sides and both from Norway as someone uh, pledging money to a cause and to the people, the indigenous people living in the forests, being afraid of their income and their livelihoods and their, uh, their places of living uh, becoming uh, conserved and that they are not going to be allowed to be a part of the, the growing economy. Uh, I think that there are definitely uh, options and, and possibilities of finding a way of making sure that it is income for people, making sure that the people actually living in the forests will see the benefits of the work that is done, and at the same time showing to uh, the people that ultimately, say, pay taxes in order to put funds available to see that this, uh, these funds are being used for the benefit not only of some high uh, theoretical goal of uh, combating climate change, which unfortunately to a lot of people seems a bit out in the open and away there, but instead showing that this is something that can benefit individuals and it can benefit everyone. Uh, making sure that the work that we do, uh, that we do not put up um, a perfect ideal option as the only option, finding options that are uh, practical and that can be, can be achieved is more important in order to solve the issues than to find the ideal option that will never work for anyone except one party anyway. Uh, thank you. So far I haven't heard anybody mention this morning, I don't think, and not on this panel, for sure, the word adaptation. And uh, there was a significant shift in the emphasis coming out of the Paris Agreement and certainly reflected in the NDCs to put a lot more attention on adaptation. And maybe uh, I can invite any of the panelists who want to comment on how we move forward with adaptation, but especially Ibu Nur, I think coming from the perspective of a developing country, most of the developing countries have emphasized the importance of support in adapting to climate change. Yeah, I think um, uh, from uh, Paris Agreement, actually we have a, a, a strengthened uh, a political um, momentum there on the adaptation uh, issues and uh, in fact we also have uh, loss and damage uh, there and uh, another uh, issue is if in the past adaptation uh, was considered as a national issue now become uh, the uh, global issues and we have uh, uh, global uh, goals uh, Indonesia is one among countries that uh, include uh, adaptation component in the NDCs, uh, especially because uh, as um, archipelagic countries, we are uh, and also located in the ring of uh, fire, we are really uh, vulnerable to climate change and other uh, natural um, catastrophes. And um, 
we also see uh, the importance of the role of uh, ocean, both on adaptation and uh, mitigation. I think why um, I didn't mention about adaptation in the uh, presentation, uh, in fact, that's because it's uh, too much complied to the uh, guidance of uh, the question uh, that should be addressed by uh, panel. In fact, when we talk about uh, Red Plus, we uh, have a lot of uh, non-carbon benefits. And um, if you look at there, many uh, adaptation related the benefits that we could get. So um, I think uh, from time to time, we could not uh, separate the adaptation and mitigation issue in this case. Yeah, this is exactly what I was hoping you would bring out, that, the, uh, uh, that these can go hand in hand. The, the, the benefits from good forest management and utilization and things like uh, agroforestry and sustainable land management uh, are certainly a part of both mitigation as well as adaptation, or can be. Any other panel members want to comment on that before I ask uh, the audience to pose some questions? Peter? Yeah, th th this is really an interesting topic uh, because if we now talk about climate action in the context of sustainable development, then the whole adaptation debate kind of moves into that direction too, because what is adaptation if it isn't improving the, the uh, opportunities for uh, improved well-being and livelihoods? Um, and then you, you end up in a, in a situation where it's difficult to say what is adaptation to climate change and what is beyond that uh, investment in sustainable development. Of course, if you discuss it in a, in a convention context, it becomes more an issue of, of uh, funding and uh, losses and damage compensations and, 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 uh, um, and so on. But if you, if, if you look at it in the, in the broader perspective, it might be different. I'd like to, to refer to a report from the World Bank's Office on Disaster Risk Reduction that came, up, came out not so long ago. Um, they had calculated the uh, increased costs due to increased risks um, when it came to water supply. And they had looked specifically at the North Africa and Near East region. And they had looked at a various, various set of issues. They had looked at climate change, they had looked at uh, infrastructure, they had looked at con consumption patterns, they had looked at other, other aspects, and, and then calculated that the cost will be about 1.6 trillion. I don't know over what time period, but that's not the point here. The point is that when this study was referred to in media, only the climate change factor was mentioned, and the, and, and the headline became 1.6 trillion is needed to, to deal with the climate change risks. So we are, we are again living in a blurred reality here. What, what are we talking about when we talk about adaptation? And are we even going so far as to say that Climate change is the problem rather than lack of public investments in infrastructure and, and water supply systems. That would have been needed anyway. So it, it is a very interesting debate. There is no doubt that adaptation need, is needed and that investments in, in, uh, in, in forest and landscape can help that. Uh, but we also, from a, shall we say, more um, theoretical perspective, need, need to analyze this. this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now could I invite some questions uh, or very brief comments from the audience? Uh, please, uh, we have microphones placed strategically. If uh, somebody jump up and uh, get things started, sit, give us your name and uh, where you're from and who you want to direct your question to. Yes, please, in the back. Good to have someone start and then uh, Please, a few others follow. Hello. Okay, my name is uh, Mahmoud Yusuf. I'm from HOB Center, Brunei Darussalam. So first, let me uh, congrat congratulate our Honorable Minister for the successful uh, organization of this summit today. So I've got a few questions here. So the first, th the first one I want, I want to hi highlight here is the issue of illegal logging. I didn't hear anything from the three panels, four panels they uh, mentioning illegal logging that contributing to the, uh, to the uh, climate change. So perhaps 
uh, how this illegal logging incorporated, incorporated into the climate change uh, uh, initiative. Secondly, <coughs> I'm, uh, at national perspective, we have been putting our forests aside for the sake of climate change. And we, have, we are managing our forests in a deficit way because we get revenue from our forests just a little for the sake of environmental protection. So how this can be uh, become global issue? Because I like the, the word, uh, the, the phrase said by the, the lady pedal day, national issue is not become a national, it's a global issue now. So can I put this national issue into the global issue that managing a forest is something that we have to consider is a government uh, uh, burden to us. So is there any, any program that this uh, climate change summit in Paris consider uh, the amount that we have to pay every year to manage our forests for the sake of climate change. So, and third question, is there any economic program that to support us to do our forests in, the, in a way that we can also support our national vision 2035 that we have to have uh, support our economic growth. So this is very important for us. We cannot just wall up our forests for the sake of economic growth. We have to consider the global communities also. We have to give good environment to them. So this is our, our good national policy that we have. That we have to be good in our neighbor. We have to be good in with the global communities while giving good environment to them. So any any return that we can get from the global communities and in order for us to maintain, protect our forests for the sake of the global communities. So, uh, I just discussed with my friend here from the PMO about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Paris Agreement. What I heard is just carbon trading, they focus on very, very poor country only. So to me, that's not very fair for us because developed countries their preference is to the very very poor country so 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 my question here is there any opportunities that developing country also have a chance to have a carbon trading in the future huh? and the, the most uh, disappointing uh, uh, statement that i heard from them is that we are categorized as developing countries once come to funding, we are categorized into developed countries, developed country. So to me, this is a double standard. So perhaps uh, this panel can solve for us in a national context and also a global context. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, many questions posed there. Uh, I toss to any of the panel members who would like to respond. Some of it was commentary, some of it was question. <laughs> Uh, maybe uh, somebody want to take the first one in, because quite a lot has been already initiated uh, to deal with illegal logging as part of the part of the issues, or any of the other. Ibu Noor, I think you're you'd like to come or any. Yeah, um, many uh, uh, questions. Um, yeah, first about the illegal logging. I think we know that uh, um, there are, uh, there have been a lot of uh, efforts, both uh, at the uh, national and uh, regional as well as international level. At the national uh, level, for example, uh, the, the effort of uh, uh, Indonesia, just to give example, with the uh, certification scheme or uh, with SVLK scheme uh, assuring the, the uh, legality and sustainability uh, of the origin of uh, the timber that we exported and uh, exported to other countries. Um, I think in the context of climate change, I think because we talk about the uh, uh, climate change, uh, here, uh, what is the the impact of illegal logging? Uh, we know in the in the forest will uh, uh, increase the the forest degradation, 
degradation uh, and vice versa, the, the improving the governance, tackling with illegal logging is uh, uh, part of the uh, resolving or mitigating the climate change. I think one more that I want to respond actually. This is about the carbon trading uh, things. Um, I think for uh, about the uh, d developing countries in the past, uh, with uh, a trading uh, with off offset the mechanism, uh, we sell uh, the whole or part of the credits uh, overseas. Uh, we have uh, we didn't have any commitment in the past. Now I think. The, that we, we need to, to consider is uh, uh, how far our, uh, we, we, we will go uh, for that uh, trading with the uh, offset the scheme as we also have a commitment under uh, our uh, NDC. I think the issue of uh, uh, Brunei, I can, uh, uh, I can see that because we have experience, for example, um, but we, we don't have I don't have answer also. Maybe other other pan, uh, panel have answer. Uh, when uh, we get uh, sponsorship of, with uh, our event, we cannot finance Singapore and Brunei because it's uh, considered as, um, as developed developed countries among us. So I think uh, the question to other panelists. I think. Um, yeah, about the return from international communities. I think if we, we look at the, uh, how we interpret the Paris uh, uh, Agreement, uh, learning from our, our experience, how our minister translating pa Paris Agreement, uh, we have uh, international responsibility, but also uh, national needs uh, where we have to do something for our na national effort. Uh, international community, I think, um, I see that Yes, of course, there are uh, a lot of uh, climate finance uh, available, but uh, that's just not always easy to uh, access. That there are, so that's that's the issue. Another issue, I think, uh, the uh, fair uh, treatment in international uh, uh, trading scheme. I think that's uh, also uh, one thing that. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, strat struggling, especially uh, for developing countries. I think this uh, issues there are many for other panels. Thank okay. you. Thank you.